is going to give us a little specification on catalyzation of atomic coding, which sounds really, really neat. Jeff, we're going to test you later. I'm going to listen very, very carefully while I drink my beer. Was it on your writer? compliment in there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find it. Yeah. 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 Oh. <laughs> Was there a compliment? Yeah. Say it again. No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> I'll email it to you. You'll have to watch the recording. He doesn't read his email. You've got a Facebook account. Oh, jeez. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brandon, do you want to hear from Yeah. 
the second bill term. So what, what it is is that the extroverts, they need this like increased intensity to be able to perform. So if you ever met like an athlete who's like really intense, and, and because they're so intense, the only way they can get across the finish line is if they go really fast, right? But if you're an introvert, you're more like, you know, you just build yourself, yourself up, and it's really gentle. You're good, right? So similar to just being productive in general, the introverts need silence. <coughs> but they still need help. It's not that they're just awesome, right? I mean, maybe you are. You are, maybe. Two awesome introverts get it done. So the one thing about the studies that shows is neither of the group of people should ever listen to familiar music while you're doing work. And the reason for that is because you get sidetracked by familiar music. So you're like working along, you're in your group, and suddenly, you know, for me it's cerebralis. It comes on and you're like, oh yeah, and then you just fix it all up. That kind of derails your productivity. Cool. So now we're going to talk about patternization. Again, a term I made up. You may be out there, but with regards to this. Um, patternization is a skill by which one creates and utilizes a series of one or more patterns to match the forms. Now, I'm going to take a break here. I didn't actually make up the concept. I just made up the word. But I'm sharing it. So the important thing about patternization is that it takes practice. Secondly, do not ever annoy others while you're practicing. Because if you're sitting there going, mm -hmm, sh -hmm, sh -hmm, sh -hmm, sh -hmm, if you thought you were going to pull a couple of girls, you're going to be like, shut the hell up, you know? But that's OK, because
start from one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Do it in pairs. Is that clear? Does everyone need anything more clear than that? Okay, let me put my timer on. Mark, set, go. Okay, so how many of you did best on just a flat out number coming? Okay, four, five, five, two, six. How many of you did best on one? No one? No. Not one. Two. That was two. Two of you. How about three? One? Four? Four? Five? Five? Okay, I'm pretty sure this is on.
Okay, so keep those numbers in mind as I finish this section about patternization. Okay? So now we're going to go on to a different story. Um, this is about birds. Studies say, you know, there's some evidence that birds can count. Has anyone heard that before? Birds can count. So there's a story of a, a woman, and I forgot her name, I have it in here, but I don't care. Um, she went and observed some fishermen who used birds to help them fish. Now, the fishermen paid the birds by every eight fish that they caught that they would get to go keep, they would get to keep it and eat it. So the birds would catch seven fish and then stay on the boat and not budge. They could push them off, the birds would fly right back and just wait until they were released from their whatever they had out of them, some sort of leash or whatever. And then they could go and catch their eight fish and get and go back to work. So through that study, there was a conclusion that birds can count. They know when it's their seventh bird. Then they got to stay there and get, to get released. Second to that, there's another story that I've heard before. Um, this is, I haven't heard of a study, I just heard the story. So the, this is a story about a crow who also can count. The crow would sit on the perch on, on the tree and watch a person go into the barn. If the person left the barn, the crow would then fly into the barn. So another time the person went into the barn and a second person went into the barn. If the first person left and then the second person left, the crow would fly into the barn. Again for a third person. If three people went into the barn and then a fourth person went into the barn, by the time the three people left, the crow would not remember that there was a fourth person in the barn and would fly in. So crows, I mean birds can count. That's really the, 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 the gist of this part. So crows can count to three, is, is what the, the theory is. Um, parrots can count to six. And I don't have the study that shows that, but I looked it up. And the fisherman birds, remember they're called to count to seven. So this is all very awesome and nice, but what does it mean for this and why, why does it even matter? Um, the interesting thing is that humans learn through simulation. I'm not sure I stole that, right? Um, as a child, we learn everything by observing others and then trying it out for ourselves. So, you know, you've seen that. Does anyone here have kids? You have kids. So you've seen, like, when they're little babies, they kind of mimic you and then they learn how to do it. So let's learn from birds. That's really the problem story. You can all go home now. No, i The extroverts. The extroverts, with regards to the patterns that you just learned, um, really do well with music, noises, like fans, talk, like talk shows being on television. And sometimes, yes, even distraction. Sometimes if you're distracted for a second, it propels you right back into your work. Has anyone ever experienced that before? For like in the groove, get a phone call, first they're pissed off, and like, oh yeah, I'm even better at this. Anyone ever experienced that? The introverts, they're more motivated through emotion, internal thoughts, sure really are. Us extroverts don't really know what that is, but that's okay. <laughs> um, so that being said, I want you to take your magic number that you learned today, and at home, start to sit home. Um, use these things that I have listed here. Whatever works for you, you kind of have an idea since you've had the experience before. Use a fan, you put on a talk show if you're an extrovert, put on a talk show, put on something external that keeps you stimulated and keeps you going. Use your magic number as well. So if you, it, it takes some practice, but if you sit there and let's say your magic number was three, and you've got some music on, put on a waltz, like not these ones. That's three, if your magic number is six, but you know, it's a good number for that. Run a waltz, it's a, it's a three beat. But use this as a form, a formula to figure out what exactly can propel me, what can keep me busy in that magic number. Because it's that magic number you're gonna be able to do better, as we just demonstrated. That's the number that you got the highest score in. Does that make sense? Okay. So introvert, oh sorry. Okay, so let's say that you're an introvert and the only way that you can do well, you don't like music, the only way you can do well is to like tap. But obviously, this is really annoying to other people. Make it really small. Really big. And eventually, just make it like this. You can. Mm -hmm. And then, you may look like you have to rest, but that's okay. At least you're, you're performing better, right? Okay, so that's it with regards to patronization. Um, it's fun. Make it small, make it all smarter. And, you know, explain to people you're being awesome and proficient and efficient whenever they ask you to do that. So, is there any questions about that before we move on?
So how are you supposed to do it? So I'm, I'm using tapping, for example, yeah. and I'm, I'm tapping in counts of five, because five is my magic number. Right. How would I do it? Or would I find music that matches that number? That's, and how, that's how would I go about doing that? That's one way to do it, and I can't tell you that find music that matches that number, but that's one way. Mm -hmm. Another one is, like, if you're using tapping, you could just use tapping. One, two, three, four, wait, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And try to keep your mind busy doing something else, not programming. Because also what doesn't happen is when you're programming, or when you're doing whatever task it is that you're trying to make better, you're, you're going to internalize it no matter what. You're going to internalize the number. The more you practice it, the more you internalize it, and the more you become awesome. Make sense, right? So in your sense, do something else that that distracts your mind. One thing that very much comes to my mind is something really stupid and silly. Get one of those little compasses that you're going to spin. Or a top. So do your pattern and spin the top. But it's something that keeps you on your pattern, but also keeps you busy. Ideally, it would be something you can measure. So, because that way you can measure whether you're getting better at it or not. That make sense? Does that help? Mm -hmm. Okay, is there anything else? Any other questions about prioritization? Okay. You guys can email all of you have questions. Yeah. I was just going back to the other ways to make sense of the definition. I haven't done anything. Hand clicking, yeah, that's fine. It was always in threes, but I didn't know twos. Yeah. Hand clicking is also, it's funny because we think that people are just fucking annoying. Excuse my language. But we just think people are being annoying. Stop with hand clicking. But really, they're actually activating their mind to be better at what they're doing. and 
everything's lost and gone forever because you didn't save it or you didn't put it somewhere and you know whatever. Then you have to go to your boss and say, look, no you're paying me out of here. Okay, I project. But I screwed up, man, I screwed up. You know, don't have to do that for the time I could because you only went back just a few minutes even. So um, the other another benefit to doing this is that every single time you commit your code, it's working. You don't commit it. And suddenly everything's not working and it's blowing up. And you know it's working because you tested it. Now that doesn't mean that you don't have a tester to go through your code. It's super important to have a tester. But you know that someone's not going to go into the repository, pull down the code, and blow up their whole website. It's important because you know you can test it. Um, and then second to that, uh, oh, it, it helps you to hone in on your attention to detail. It's funny that I couldn't use that line. <laughs> Um, it helps you to be able to go break things down into really super, super small steps. And now you can actually have your resume that you have a skill of paying attention to detail because you do, because you're learning it. And then also clean up code reviews. Does anyone here have a code reviews? You do? Okay. So you know the experience of code reviews, right? Like you're like, what the hell is this? You know. But if you have it more higher encapsulated and you have functions that do one thing and one thing only, it's cleaner. Now it's annoying as hell as a programmer to have to back through function after function after function, but we all know that it's actually better to do that, right? So, in conclusion, what if you can combine atomic coding, which you just learned, and categorization? Those two things. What if? Do, can you imagine that would be beneficial? Maybe? No? I don't know. Totally screwed up. Okay. Um, so try it and let me know how it goes. I have an email address. I didn't come down here. So Tell me how it goes. Practice it. You now have the skill to practice both. Practice it. Um, and let me know. So one last note about this is to measure your productivity so you know when it's working. Because if you just practice it and you don't measure it, you don't have any idea if it's actually making you more efficient. Does that make sense? What if I like annoying my office mates? Say that again? <laughs> what if I like annoying my office This mates? is the perfect tool for you. Awesome. <laughs> and then you can blame it on that. Look, man, I'm just becoming more efficient. I'm going to blame it on you. Oh, you blame it on me too. Okay, cool. That's okay. I'll, I'll post it on the website somewhere. <laughs> um, okay, any other questions about it? Atomic coding or organization? <clears throat> so, headphones or no headphones? Um, I don't know about that study, but I personally work better with headphones. What? Does anyone else have a preference about that? I think. Uh, I think um, <laughs> it just helps you to block out the other distractions. Do you? Yeah, so I think some extroverts need that distraction. I was thinking that the TV on the radio on the top of my heart is on the other edge. Right. Cool. So, is there any other questions? Do you have five? Do you know your magic number? At least you learned something.
Se non vede anche dei tempi di servizio. Put it in geriatric mode. <laughs> <laughs>
Post types. Yes, it does. It supports it fully supports uh, its post types and has comments. Which is So does that mean things like posting by email instead of getting a lot more control? Um it means that if you were doing things via XML or VC. Like a query by XML basically? <coughs> or remote? Um um this would be for external external anything to yeah. communicate with your Microsoft Live Writer, a whole bunch of different stuff. Exactly. Or if you want to direct something separately and have it post, uh, that'll make it easier too. Or like what Lucy was saying, where you're submitting a post to a post type instead of just a post. Right. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. You can do that now. Still in JSON, although I'm kind of crossing my fingers that Automatic will push that stuff over
may or may not. But if you do, it's now pretty, not ugly. <laughs> and that's good. It's also a lot faster. Exactly. Yep. And as a result, uh, you can now replace uh, templates and subdirectories. Um, Mason has an article, an article um, explaining when you should and shouldn't use it. And yeah, I'll post the slides afterwards so that you guys can read a little bit more about it. Um, WordPress 3.4 is going to be released sometime in May, or at least that's the plan. The date has not been decided. We'll see. Uh, I, I'm not, yeah, it should get released in May. It's already gotten pushed a few times, but that's a pretty big target, so I have, I have confidence. So those are all the, those are all the specifics that I had. It wasn't just how much time I had or didn't have. Um, but you can see lots more information, both in track and on um, the codex article for 434. Does anyone have any questions? Is there a, I know one of the topics that they talked about that uh, working at San Francisco last time around was responsive admin. Is there any progress to be on that? Um, there was a little bit of progress made um, by, yes. <laughs> there was a little bit of progress made uh, regarding, especially for tablets. And um, I know browse teams now works better there. And they've updated a couple of the screens so that they flow better for tablets. Um, okay. I don't just think there has been, I don't think there has been any progress or I wouldn't say any because I don't read all of the patches. No. <laughs> I don't remember all of the patches. Um, I don't think there's been that much progress on for cell phones or anything smaller than a tablet. Um, but some things work better on tablet now. Um, a couple things that didn't make the slides. Um, you can now use HTML captions. When they do these types of updates, do they also uh, try to update the the mobile applications as well? The what? I'm sorry. Do they do they try to update the mobile applications as well, or are they kind of behind a little bit with the mobile um, applications? I don't think the cycles are are directly connected. Um, I'm just curious because of the changes, XML RPC part of it. Right. If there were changes that required that the that the mobile apps get updated. So I don't know how their cycles work. Okay. You did mention though that the WordPress app is using some portion of this already. Did you say that? No. Um, what I was saying was that the WordPress app uses XML RPC to get all the data um, So this would be some of those changes would be things that it could use. The XML RPC. The API existed before, it's just an example.
I mean, what's the forward to your slides? Uh, speaking of which. Uh, so I was presentation in San Diego, you were on the scene. And I looked at the front row and saw the very front row. And you turned Dave and Lucy. She said, you guys are all there, right? West is not. I think you might have dropped on the Maybe you know. Maybe I'm going to use the presentation five times. <laughs> Let's see if it blows it up or not. Yeah. 
with the images uh, image widget function. So what we suggest is changes to the, to the guys that wrote it. So hopefully we'll be better in the future. So fragment code without editing the work files, especially the WordPress work files. You never do that, even if you're desperate. That's the last thing you want to do. And you put them in your code to let other people alter your work. Two very simple reasons why we do so. So let's see, hypothetical situation. Let's say we're desperate for a widget. Uh, place in our sidebar that displays the word awesome. Awesome. Yeah, the joke I made at WordCamp was uh, let's not get ourselves. It's not hypothetical, well then. So we go to our plugins uh, repository, we type in awesome widget, and voila, we found something called the basic awesome widget. So we put it in our plugins, we activate it, stick it in the sidebar, it has some options, it's not built well at all. So did you create that plugin specifically for this demonstration and actually put it into the plugin? And did I do your go to one, sir? It's called Photoshop. Uh, I'll, show you, no, I'll show you the code. Um, and then you activate it. And just what we wanted. It's awesome. That's exactly what we wanted. But then you're thinking about it. And this is much more appropriate uh, at San Diego WordCamp. And I said, upon further consideration, you realize that this widget is sorely lacking in puppy pictures. So now what do you do? And then we go and look into the code. So we, uh, we go into the content, we go into our plugins folder, we look into awesome-basic.php, and we see this. So there's this public function. It extracts arguments. It use something from the title. to echo the before the widget stuff. Um, put the title in after the title. And then they echo. Oh, here we go. This is all familiar. Echo. HD tag. Awesome. And then they annoy you. Well, shoot. Now we're going to drop a puppy picture in there. We can't. We're screwed. Um, we cracked her a little bit. And then we decided to write our own plug in here. We got a whole lot better. Had the programmer been thinking forward, like some programmer would drop some stuff in here, some stuff in here, and maybe mess around with this stuff, they would put actually some filters in here. You never would have to look at this, I mean, you never would know what the actual filters are. But you never have to touch this, and you can alter this thing to your whimsy. Oh, that's the part we're going to look at there. Okay, so we go back in with the, uh, the plugin repository, and we look for it deluxe. Awesome. We, we want to say awesome in the sidebar, uh, but we want to be more awesome than puppet pictures. So we find a deluxe awesome widget, and we drop it in the sidebar just below the basic awesome widget. And just by activating it, putting it in the sidebar, it looks exactly the same. It does the same thing. The difference is, here's the code for it. So we get our arguments, and in the title, you already see this apply filters, and we don't exactly know what that does yet, but this is already looking better. Uh, we have some title, oh, we have this do action here, okay, that's cool. We have this echo more filters, okay, that's kind of cool. We have this do action here. So now we have some options. I think, hmm, remember, actions do stuff and filters change stuff. So we can do some stuff here, do some stuff there, we can change this, we can change that if we want. All right, let's get crazy. Right. Okay, this is the correct, uh, okay, there's a filter there. You said we're not I'm not going to do yours. So I've never heard of the Laura's again. But this is the reason they should already have ready. So, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do this again. I know because I, I started talking about all this stuff, and I forgot I put these things in here to remind myself to talk about this stuff. And then now I'm being laughed at and ready to go by my peers. So, actions, remember, those do stuff. I know, I appreciate that, but still. Um, so, we have three functions. Remember, all you can remember is actions do stuff, filters change stuff. So if you really want to do this, now remember this stuff too. How do we do this stuff? We have three functions. One's called do actions, we have one called add actions, and one's called remove actions. Don't worry about this one so much right now. It's cool, but we won't build them just yet. So the do actions is what I, as a programmer, would put into my code for you to be able to access it. Add actions is what you would do as the other person to access what I put in. So kind of do action and add action kind of talk to each other a lot. Remove action, we use when somebody puts in an action that we're not happy with, and we want to say, ah, it's saying on that action, A, or whatever the people are action. Uh, so we get one, so the do action function, we have one 
variable that's required, and that's the tag, which is in the green there. The other, other arguments don't worry about so much. Uh, when you get really good at actions, you can start figuring out what that is. But for now, just remember the tag. So the tag is the action that we're getting into. So we say, uh, let's see. So here, we have do action before awesome which is this is the tag. So again, this is me writing this plugin, and I say do this action right here. And then you as maybe the theme developer would say, I'm gonna I'm gonna access that action right there. The tag. We're both gonna say we're talking about the before awesome widget, not the after awesome widget action. Oh, I might use that one too. Okay. So then you as the outside developer, not the theme or plugin developer, you would use the add action. So you would say, Add action at the point that I, you know, the tag, whatever we call that. At that point, do this function that I'm going to write. Those are the two things you definitely need a tag and a function. <coughs> we can also set a priority and we can set some next arguments. Again, don't worry about that something just yet. So, let's see. So, what we're going to do is we're going to tap into the do action before us, which is because we're going to drop our puppy picture in before it says awesome. That's right. Puppy is awesome. This, I did puppies, by the way, because uh, uh, the day of Sunday 14th was like the International Puppy Day. That's not joking, so that's not the website. Never mind. But cats are awesome. Nah. I'm not a cat person. I'm in the spirit of the internet. You're fine. I'm not going to say that you're wrong. You're probably missed the joke, or is that a little insult? I'm not sure. Actually, you did. Shut down the pipe. So before that puppy picture comes up, 
We want to say warning, don't be pictures coming because it's pretty adorable and we want someone to be psyched. But we can use the same action that comes before it says awesome. So this is the same. Now I'm saying add this action uh, before awesome widget, same action. And now we're going to write a function called warning. So we're going to say warning, echo. Warning, puppies are coming. Back and forth. Yeah, same action. It's different functions. So we get, uh, when that comes up, is we get a delight awesome widget, we get a puppy. And then we get our warning puppies, and then we get awesome. Now the reason that happened is because when WordPress has come through, it said, okay, I see this function, I'll do that, and I see this, I'll do that. And I realized, well, you know what? That's totally in the wrong order. You can't show the puppies, and then more people will have That's not going to work at all. You might have had their heart attack already. Okay, so that's where each of those come from, the action and the function that we use. Pizza's here. <laughs> you guys need a break? Wait, pause. Mm -hmm. Actually, let me get through this one thing because I think filters is kind of really quick to stop with action. So, okay, so without rearranging our code so that it's you know, in the right order, that's in the priority variable well author, the one that I showed you. So we can say, you know, do that one second, then do that one first. And we're going to go, okay, I get what you're saying. Come on. The default is 10, so if you don't put anything in that going to assume that you So we just put in these priority things, we can leave the code alone, and then, wow, we get more, and then, oh. Stickers didn't move on. What's going on? You guys hogging it over on this side? No. I'm yes. just busy doing other stuff. <laughs> what?
They've been around for like 10 years, but they've been doing WordPress for like two and a half. Before that, they were using um, .NET. So they've always been doing some kind of web development. And then they discovered WordPress. <laughs> that was better than .NET. Says it's recording. <laughs> Is anyone watching? Cool. 
Это просто Yeah, I don't know. 
Oh, okay. I sure am. But then there's a lot of Recording and streaming at the same time. Um, it's a hundred dollar Or like a nice brochure that's not really converting. It does okay. I have a good mix. I have a base. What are you doing? Well, that is. Here's the video. Yeah, I'm gonna write this. Yeah, I can bring up Twitter. Mm-hmm. I'll flip through all the Twitter stuff. I can make the logo disappear and reappear. So they're lower third. Sweet. Software talent. I'm using Wentz TV. Oh, oh yeah, I have that one. I try to use it. Um, so you can do this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you can do picture and picture. picture. Start back up. And then flip flop between them. No, I, I try to use it. I, I try to use it once, and I, you know, never mind. Mm-hmm. I, I cannot do it like a real editing, uh, real time. So, right. So that's a little bit harder. Than, but than what, it for like what I'm trying to do for this, it's, mm-hmm. it's nice because it's like yeah. any of these little things I want to do, grab my disposable phone. Yeah, and yeah turn them on and go. Yeah, yeah. That, I find that very, very easy to use. But so the title yeah. at the bottom. All the presets that you can have. Mm-hmm. On this. You can just build them beforehand and then. Yeah. Where you go? I'm cwp.org slash live. And then when I'm done, I make it live on um, on YouTube. Alright, is everybody back who's interested? Like anyone who's not here. Okay. 
Did you need your... No, I put a second one. Oh, okay. It's going to... The, the, the way you get to the point in the thing... Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to have to stop. 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 It makes sense what happens. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so the colors... Oh, pardon me. Yeah. In this example, we're going to change text, although they do change stuff, which is important to remember. Uh, again, we have three functions. Unfortunately, it's not do filters, add filters, and remember they did apply filters, plural, add filters, singular, and remove filters. So apply filters uh, is what you put in your code for other people to access it. Add filters is what you use to access someone else's code. And remove is to knock off whatever shenanigans are going on that you're unhappy with. So, uh, apply filters. This time it's two variables that we're sending in with functions. So we have apply filters, tag, same kind of thing. It's the handle that we're using to refer to this whole particular filter. Value is what is it that we're changing. So again, we're changing stuff, not just doing stuff. Uh, and again, extra variables, don't worry about those. Just yet. And then we're accessing someone else's code. We have add filters, so we have a tag. What function, and this is almost the same, and we have priority, and we've accepted arguments, which I'll show you, but don't worry about, that will make your mind vibrate a little bit. So, let's see, what are we changing? Filtering it here, and another plugin was filtering it here. So we write a second one, 
Uh, it says add filter, filter awesome text using the same filter. And the second filter is the function name right here. We pull in the text. And this one says take the text and wipe out whatever was there before and change it to dogs. Puppies is a little too cutesy. We don't want that. Awesome doesn't make sense. Why are you even saying awesome in the picture of a dog? It's insane. And then we return the text. So what's going to happen is WordPress is going to run through this code. It's going to do this one first and then this one because that's the order we did. We didn't tell it any other order. So what happens is we take the H2 of awesome, go from there. We can get it with puppies. Then that text is sent into the second one, which gets wiped out because we're not concatenating anymore. We were there and now we're saying, you know what? Whatever was there before, we don't even care. Just make text equal to dogs. That's enough. Not weird. Ridiculous. And then return that text. And then that goes on to whatever it's doing after that. Just like that. Oh, I'm that puppy. Man, it's a little patch on the eye. Crazy. How can you guys stand it? I'm sitting there with my Woo! There we go. <laughs> so now I'm sorry? It's in the CSS. That's in the CSS. Um, yeah. Nice save. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it is William. Uh, all the other ones are always. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's just go with the CSS. Because it was an external CSS that was brought in. <laughs> the the Ashi script that I didn't talk about when I was breaking my pants. You were so distracted. And you didn't even notice the uh, key scripts going on. Okay, so now we're saying, you know what, uh, that doesn't make sense at all. Let's say dogs and then puppies. That makes sense, right? All we need to do is we throw in our priority variables. Again, so we have these over here. Okay. Uh, and up there with that camera. So now we're just going to say, oh, instead of just going in the order that I receive them, you wanted to do this one. You want to do this one first? And then you want to do one? Okay. <laughs> That's what WordPress says. And it says it like that. It's like three different choices. Actually, that's how it works. WordPress uses this. Do you want it to go to the left? No, no. It wants to go to the second half of the No. It's not close either. It's not at all what I said, WordPress. So this time, because WordPress is smart, it says, oh, you want to take that text? And you want to do this one first? Yeah. Okay. And then once that's going down, we return this text here, and then we send it up to that one. And then, so we take text is now, it gets rid of the awesome, says now it's H2, concatenates, concatenates the puppies onto it, sends it off into the world. <coughs> ah! Adorable. Dogs! Puppies. Because there's an exclamation point, and no capitalization. So how's that? Different on both sides. Yes, that's. 
And the text I'm going to do is awesome. The pattern is going to do, take the first thing, make class awesome, stick it in there, close that tag. So say now, awesome is the S print F or sprint. Pattern wrap text pattern. Oh, sorry, pattern wrap text wrap. Definitely sprint. Why sprint that? Sprint. Sprint three, print that. It's a way to. Becomes a sprint. I'm not a big fan of it. Um, Genesis uses it sometimes, so I use it. Uh, you use it in because you use it to force the variable type. It's it's builds a dynamic. It's yeah, it's more for building dynamic strings. So you know, we knew what we were going to want to do was some sort of tag class awesome something something in that tag and then close that same tag. But sometimes we want it to be H2, sometimes we want it to be H3. In this case, you know, it could be some kind of wild to learn it. I don't know. So, but I can tell it. Um, you take this pattern, and you know, imagine this being like the first thing, the second thing, the third thing. So I say, take this pattern, throw that in the first thing, throw that in the second thing, throw that in the third thing. But I can change it up. It's crazy, crazy mix of us. Um, the reason being that when I do this filter, I'm going to make it so that you can get crazy with it as well. So I don't, I don't want to bind you, you know, to this pretty ridiculous string. I want to let you create whatever you want. You want to do this for me? I So then I say, apply filters. Uh, filter ridiculous text. Oh, that's the name that I'm giving you. Awesome. So this is like the, the string that I'm sending, which is what we built. Which is going to be, you know, if it's the home page, it's going to be H2 awesome and H2. It's not home, it's going to be H3 awesome and H3. And then I'm throwing these extra things on right here. Wrap and text, which were, wrap's going to be either H2 or H3, and then text is just going to be the word awesome. So these are our extra variables. Had we not done that, you know, we, we were on the phone ahead of time. But now we have this extra stuff. And the reason that is, if you're super savvy, you might want to take those variables and manipulate them. After the fact, to do um, hideous things with them and then send them back out to the world. So, focus on this part right here. Uh, oh, hey, this would be much better to describe than sending it out loud. So, if it's home, this is what's going to get spit out. If it's not home, that's what's going to get spit out. That's handy. So, oh, one of those extra variables, that's weird. That I pointed out. Okay, so let's assume we're on the home page. And we say, add filter, filter ridiculous text is the filter we're tapping into. Ridiculous filter is the function that we're going to write. We want priority 10. And then we're saying that the last thing is the extra arguments we're saying, there's going to be three. So let's assume there's going to be one, and we're taking that text or whatever we're saying. Now we're going to say, three things are coming in, be ready for that. So when we write this function, we have text and we have variable one, variable two. So those are three variables that we're stuck in. Or again, preparing it. It's going to be three. Be ready for that. So, I think I'm probably some arrows that's going to tell me how this matches up. So, the three refers to those three variables coming in. Again, if we'd done it regular, we would assume one and just awesome would have come over. So, that first variable that we named gets whatever was an awesome, which in this case is H2 awesome H2. Second variable is going to get wraps up, which is just H2. And then, no surprise, or very shocking to you. I don't know if you're super confused at this point. <coughs> that third one's going to get the text string up awesome. So now that I have all three of those things, I can rearrange them and do all kinds of things if I want. What I happen to do is I said, change variable two to not awesome, because this is ridiculous and not awesome at all. Don't even bother with that class thing. That's not, who needs that, right? Maybe class awesome. It's already awesome. Or maybe it's awesome. So we're shortening with it. And then we're rebuilding that spring F. And then we're returning the new because again if I go up and, and the different results is going to be awesome. And essentially we're just going to make the same not awesome. Because it's not, that's uh, <coughs> way too much. Because you're asking yourself right now, why wouldn't I just take that one variable, wipe it all out, do whatever I want? I don't know, I would do the same thing. Forget this guy. <laughs> Uh, this thing has 
crazy actions and filters in it all the time, which is why I like using it. So, if you grab the Genesis you know, base framework, this is what it looks like. It's super exciting. But if you turn off, uh, sorry, turn on all the actions, it's all these yellow boxes. So at any one of these ones, we can make something happen. We can throw in a banner here, we can throw in some, I don't know, I have a widget high sidebar up there, does that make sense? Okay, uh, here's filters. So we can filter the title, the description, post title, uh, post info, the post meta, and uh, probably some stuff in the widgets that aren't showing. Okay. These are the things that I use most often. So WordPress has over 790 actions. Maybe there'll be more in 3.4. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> You're a poet, you didn't know it. That's right. No, I didn't know it was not. Uh, tons of filters. The Genesis framework has more than 200 actions, over 100 filters. Gravity Forms has a ton of actions and filters. Shop is our e commerce solution of choice. Has tons. But the good stuff will have a lot of actions and filters in there, so you can really. So you can see when we were messing with uh, there's a good example back here. When we were messing with this widget, this one right here doesn't even do what uh, the plugin originally said to do, which is fix it. Awesome. That's all it's supposed to do. We hijacked it so much it doesn't even do that anymore. It does all this crazy other stuff, but we never touched the plugin code. That's how cool it looks on when you become a, a wizard, which is a rank you can achieve if you do this enough. So are we gonna add all that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's in D&D. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we can have a hook wizard. Yeah, we do have a dexterity. Okay, so when you're looking for these hooks, hopefully the plugin or the theme or whatever you're using is some kind of wiki that you can, that's going to list them all out for you. Gravity Forms definitely has one. Shop Sword has one. WordPress definitely has one on like uh, this, uh, it's this link right here. I think it starts talking about them and the page for each one. Barring the wiki, see if there's any sort of documentation, maybe the PDF that came with it, or the readme file sometimes will tell you something like that. Barring that, go searching through the actual actual code. So just do you know search site wide or just look at the plugin function and say, find new action or find apply filters. It'll bring them all up. Not the best way to do it, but you will find it a little more. Always try Google. That's a great resource. What's that? What it's, um, mm -hmm. so you know, you have a question, you don't know the answer to it, you want to, you know. Uh, finally, there's the WordPress Linux, the plugin API. It's got a whole bunch of other stuff. Once you get good at actions and filters, you'll get started getting, uh, I can't remember what there's other stuff on this. So, yes. Oops. Which is not nearly as exciting as I've written it up there. Yes! Oh. Okay. Actions do stuff, filters change stuff, I should have quizzed you on this part. <laughs> All right, that's my clever ending slide. Here's the link to the slide. <laughs> you care to have Jeffrey is now known as Captain Hook. <laughs> 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 Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, no, I was answering him. Yes, not you. Yes. I was wondering if Captain is a higher rank than Bizzard. In, 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 um, in the hooksphere? Yeah. Uh, it, yeah. it depends uh, if you grew up in the East or the West. How about a master hooker? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> So you got a couple options at that point. One, 
You can try to find another plugin. You can write your own plugin. You can modify the plugin and tell people about it. They can get a change it. New revision. Um, or you can fork it. Start your own version of that plugin. But then you have to be responsible for it. Yeah. <laughs> And then people start looking at you like, what are you doing now? Yeah. Yeah. I said, I can't speak a lot of you, but I don't know that. <laughs> 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 Most of them are in the best code is. Yeah. In what? Yeah. I thought it was in Romania. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I bored you to tears. <laughs> was that helpful? It was. <laughs>
work directly towards getting to your client. And that's, that's what we built. So when we started this project, I'd say, uh, you know, about May or June last year. And um, I, I kind of whipped up a prototype, brought it over to Steve. Steve said, hey, cool, let's bring Jeff in on the conversation. Um, we, we all sat down on it, thought we had a really good thing going, and said, great, this is a commercial application. This is a product that has a life. This is not just another sort of repo-based plug-in. This is an actual business idea. Um, and the business idea has you know, not been replicated. It's, it's to put um, an actual application server onto a WordPress website. And what's really neat about WordPress is that virtually any client that is going to install your product, you know what kind of headroom you have on their machine because if WordPress is running, then you have access to a whole lot of other resources. You know there's a MySQL database there, you've got access to all the actions and hooks, so you can tap into you know, a, a really wide range of functionality. So when we first sat down and, and developed it, you know, we didn't necessarily know where the marketplace was going to be. So I started digging into um, Oh, it's private now? <coughs> so, um, getting started with developing a commercial application in WordPress, I'd never done it before. Um, I'd worked as you know, a WordPress developer, I'd done work for clients, but I'd never actually built a commercial scale product and tried to bring it to market. So, one of the first things that I sort of uncovered was the GPL and what it means to the WordPress ecosystem and what it means to the WordPress community. Um, since then, it, I have discovered a whole lot of weird. Um, in a nutshell, what the GPL does is it provides a license and a protection for both consumers and developers within the WordPress ecosystem. So the GPL actually stands for the GNU Public License and it's a offshoot of a license structure that was set up, I think, 20 years ago um, to support open source software for the web. There's lots and lots of variations of these open source licenses. There's the MIT license, there's the Apache license, there's three iterations or three generations of the GPL. Um, what's really interesting is how little they're actually understood. Um, obviously, I will premise this with, I'm not an attorney. You must consult your own attorney before considering any legal advice or actions. And then, 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 what's your other So, the, the biggest fight that's really happened in the GPL is uh, thesis, thesis and on that, specifically that moment. Um, it is a really interesting battle that went all the way up to the point that it was supposed to go to court. Yep. And Chris Parsons, Pearsons, I, I can't remember his last name. Pearson. Pearson. Yeah. He backed out because he's going to get that on tape. Um, <laughs> No, I, he went all the way to literally the point that there's a great interview on the web. If you just if you just Google Matt Mullenweg versus Thesis. MixerG.com. What's that? MixerG.com. MixerG.com. Okay, so there's there's a great head-to-head -head battle between Matt Mullenweg, the founder of WordPress and the you know founder of Automatic, and you know the guy from Thesis, who, which is not the biggest, but they're one of the larger. Theme shops. And Chris's stance was I've built this product and I'm going to license it however I feel is appropriate. You know, I'm, I'm going to sell a copy and my customers will enjoy all the benefits of owning this copy of software, but they can't do anything with it outside of what my license actually says it can do. On the flip side of the coin, the GPL is not like that. 
the GPL has a couple of really weird clauses in there. I mean, they're not weird, but they're, yeah, they're weird. They're just <laughs> unbelievable when you actually sit down and read them. Don't fool man. You're among friends. And don't <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's like y'all. Yeah. The, the GPL basically says that if you create something, license it under the GPL, then the end customer can do whatever the hell they want with it, irregardless of anything that you may say. Um, so that's the GPL. It's basically, if I give you a piece of software and it's licensed under the GPL, it is yours to sell, it is yours to give, give away, it is yours to modify to your heart's content, it is yours to completely botch up or completely build upon whatever. This, that's basically the gist of the GPL. It, the upside, because typically we think about licenses and we think about, okay, well, where's the protection? The real strong part of the protection of the GPL is that it basically says, I don't warranty this at all. If, if you use this, it's licensed some of the GPL, you can't sue me for it breaking. So NASA don't build satellites using this, you know, hospitals don't use heart monitors using this. This is open, free and open source software. So what we did in uncovering sort of the, the GPL mess that's out there is I followed the lead of um, thesis and said, okay, well, I don't want to sell one copy and then have the end recipient be you know, free to do whatever they want. So we said, all right, the first iteration of Dasher had no GPL license. It was, if you buy a license from us, if you buy a seat, you can use it for your seat. That's it. You can't modify it, you can't distribute it, you can't do anything with it. And there's a big, there's a really big difference actually between open source and open source licensing. You know, open source typically means, you know, anybody and everybody is free to download it, free to tune it, free to fork it, free to do whatever they want with it. Um, open source licensing actually implies that the developer can't do anything to a consumer that abuses that license. So again, I mean, we're getting into sort of some legal, you know, but I think in general, what I'm trying to say is that the GPL is good and bad in the sense that, you know, it's sort of a legal protection for developers because now you can say, all right, I've, I've built something, I've put it out there, and, and I'm fine. Um, from a commercial standpoint, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's unbelievably bad. And I will absolutely challenge anybody to prove to me that the GPL hasn't kept the WordPress ecosystem completely in, like, amateur league. I, I mean, the biggest platform products on the market are Gravity Forms and Genesis. You know, th that's the biggest stuff that the WordPress ecosystem, which powers, you know, a measurable amount of the web. I mean, we're talking about 20s, percent of the web, more or less. It's more than that now. Is, like, is it? Pingdom released a report that it's more than 20%. I think it's, it's pushing 35 and 40. It's more than 22%. Right? Is it 25% right? of all active websites running in CMS. Wow. So, I, I mean, we're talking about a platform that has, it is by and large the web. I mean, if 55% of sites that are running CMS are running WordPress, I mean, that's a pretty good, you know, case for the web. Where's our app store? Where is our ability as developers to channel our production time and our development time into a productive return on investment? And you know, I'm in the middle of a shop that's dedicated to charging people hourly to do things, you know, which is fine. There's, there's always going to be a need for contract labor within the ecosystem. But what we really don't have is a marketplace that protects developers while simultaneously, um, you know, allowing somebody to, you know, sell our products. You know, ultimately, Dasher as a application, I shouldn't have to choose between giving it away or. You know, I got to host the entire shopping cart, and I've got to host all the customer service relationships. I mean, you've got Apple and Google both proving 
that there are really, really good, and Amazon, um, proving that there are really, really good markets for a healthy app ecosystem for smartphones, for things that are arguably less sophisticated even than a modern website. So to, to kind of go back to the point, why, why this is a big deal, is because right now if, if you create a plugin and you release it under the GPL, then you have effectively no protection under the law. There's also a really, really, really weird debate going on because there are two things in the GPL that are that have never been tested in court. The first one is this concept that they've cooked up called copy left. And copy left is total fiction. It doesn't exist. It's not law. It's never been codified. It doesn't even mean the same thing as what copyright actually means. Copy left is this crazy concept term that somebody came up with to convince people that, oh, yes, open source is good. But what copy left means is WordPress and Automatic and the WordPress Foundation is asserting that if you build into WordPress, your application inherits the GPL implicitly. You can't even say, no, 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 I'm building this thing. It's a piece of PHP, JavaScript, and CSS that exists totally separate from WordPress. Um, the WordPress uh, GPL, V2 of the GPL, has created this concept called copyleft, which basically says, if you build it into WordPress, you're inheriting the WordPress license and you can't do anything about that. Um, that's really crazy to me. That really sounds antithetical to what we're actually trying to do as developers. Because obviously, there are lots and lots of open source projects like puppy widgets that should be up. <laughs> um, you know, puppy widgets should be up on the codex. They're, you know, they're free. They, you know, come have puppy pictures on your website. This is exactly what you should want. Um, but unfortunately, what there isn't is another place to put code that is commercial in nature. Um, the interesting thing about how the GPL is actually written is that they don't specify like the point of conception. And you know, it, it's a weird thing to think about, but when does PHP code turn into WordPress code? You know, when when is baby made? You know, um, so the interesting part about that is uh, Mark um, Jacob, Jacob, I don't know how to say his last name, but he he wrote an essay that most of the WordPress core says is you know their GPL gospel that says, well, this turns into you know GPL copyleft assumption when it's run through a PHP compiler. That's when baby's made. Because we take all these WordPress actions, hooks, and filters, run them through a PHP compiler, and the end result, you can't tell the difference from WordPress running this plugin to WordPress not running this plugin. Which, if anybody's ever worked with compilers and, and interpreters before, you know that would imply that literally every piece of PHP code running on a shared host is now inheriting the GPL because you know well it's it's all the babies are all coming out of the same place so obviously we're all getting the same babies um, yeah and a little colorful here sorry about that <laughs> it's baby factors crazy um, so then there are other weird things about the GPL between PHP, JavaScript, and CSS. The GPL only covers PHP. So now you're stuck with this weird thing where, okay, well, my server-side script is being run through this you know, magical inheritor of licenses everywhere over here. But my JavaScript is being run on my, on my client's browser. So that's not covered in the GPL. And the image files aren't. And the CSS files that form how the page is going to look isn't. Uh, the, the worst thing that happened when the whole thesis versus Matt Mullenweg automatic thing happened is that they didn't go to court. 
These things have never actually been tested. Nobody's ever tested whether or not this concept of copy left actually works. Um, so even though we're eight years into WordPress and you know most people in this room have at least some or all of their you know livelihood baked into this platform, um, there's like giant legal gaping holes that have never been tested. And because of the restrictions placed on the development marketplace where you know commercial capital really can't flow into this space because we can't prove that we can protect our work. So what you end up with is this really strange relationship between independent developers and the sort of WordPress core, uh, the WordPress Foundation, which is the nonprofit arm that actually manages the trademark and also manages the license. And then there's Automatic, which is a funded, you know, booming multi-million dollar company. Um, what you end up with is a set of developers who will never be able to raise enough capital to be able to bring this to a court, which is literally what needs to get done. How does this affect you guys? Well, obviously, if you're building you know, a commercial plugin or a commercial theme, um, there are lots and lots of ambiguities. I mean, for one, there's no you know, sort of regulated, trusted ecosystem that sell your products into. You know, Brandon and Jeff launched their, their ad rotator and you know you just have to sell it yourself. Um, there are there is a different way to create plugins, which is that you can sell a service. So that's the other way of building products. And I will tell you guys point blank: if we were to redo Dasher, Dasher would be a service product. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the reason being, building Dasher the way we did is the right way to build it. Building what we built lets all of our clients actually manage their um, their product on their server. We don't have to hold any sort of relationship. So if we stopped paying our server bills, well, you know what, Dasher still runs fine on ours. It's your product. You know, it's it's a lot like owning a car. You know, you don't have to take your car to the Chevy dealer. You just have to you know put fuel found anywhere into your car and you own it, unless it's a lease different store. But um, where was I going with this? So, service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get So from from a commercialization standpoint, the right way to build this stuff would be to host it on your client's servers. Your client servers have plenty of headroom. Um, you know, the typical shared hosting account or, or you know, standalone hosting account has tons of processing power left over to do lots and lots of stuff. Um, unfortunately, you lose a lot of rights by the time that your you know third-party customer picks up that piece of software, um, you, and you won't get any support from the WordPress Foundation or Automatic, which I think is is the most frustrating part of this entire experience. Um, even to the point that uh, because we're not a full GPL uh, licensed product, we can't even sponsor WordCamps anymore. Um, literally, Automatic and the WordPress Foundation are targeting companies like ours that say, you know, we don't um, we don't oppose the GPL, but we have a modification. You know, it's it's like adding a filter. You know, yes, we accept the whole thing as filter. You know, and we also want to own our relationship with our customers. Uh, you know, that's that's been sort of the mainstay of shipped product. You know, licensing since people put products on floppy disks. Because ultimately, without a legal protection to you know keep copying and distribution in check. I mean, these are all just digital downloads. I mean, you know, and, and we no longer have even the threshold of, oh, you gotta go to the computer, you know, expo and dig fish through the floppy files and go, you know. I wanna put this in perspective. So, uh, Genesis, 
for example, is GPL pulls you out of mind, correct? Yes. Yes. So theoretically, I can buy a copy of Genesis and do anything I want to with it, right? I can give you a copy of that. In theory, yeah. Give you a copy. You Not only that, that, in theory, I can sell a yeah. copy of that. Yeah. You can buy a single copy of Genesis, post a link right here in this room, and say, everybody free to download it. Jason can videotape it, put it up on YouTube, and everybody's free to download it. And uh, you know, Brian gets your sale. Right. Now, what none of those people get is support and updates. Right. Well, the updates will work because they're not using a licensing scheme for the updates. Right. So they okay. get free updates so, to it, but they have no support, and they can't download child themes unless you give them the child themes too. Yeah. Where Gravity Forms helps is they have the license key. You can't, say, get, yeah. you can't get updates even for Gravity Forms without the license key. And, and Gravity Forms, I think, also hosts part of their product as a service. I, I've heard of people where, like, if gravityforms.com is down, their Gravity Forms literally freeze. So that may have been an old version. I've never um, seen that. I haven't. But, seen it. so, anyways, the, how does Gravity Forms run? <laughs> there's nothing. Here, here's the thing: is that there's nothing actually keeping you from building a licensed solution. The problem is, is that you're shipping open source software. Right? So, building a licensed solution yet still nudging under the GPL basically says, so your job is to break my licensing scheme. Right. You know, I have shipped you my licensing solution. I, I'll, you know. I hate to say it, but you can do it with Dashboard, absolutely. You know, if, if you've got probably 30, 40 minutes, you can find every single place that we, you know, created a licensing hook, and you can, you know, rip it all out now. And the next time that we push out an update, you won't be able to pull the update because that'll wipe out all of the changes that you made. But the theory is sound. Um, again, this doesn't come down to ethical restrictions. People will steal software. You know, Napster proved that people will steal music. Um, people have been stealing software forever. Before Napster um, <laughs> You know, yeah, people Here's will that. steal software. This isn't a question of creating a, a total stranglehold on the marketplace. This is a question of providing some sort of legal recourse for the development community to actually build you know, stronger, better, more more robust products and provide us some sort of legal protection if we see rampant or you know if, if all of a sudden a mega upload file of the thing. I mean, you know, I work I have worked on Dashboard thus far for a year trying to get it better for my clients. You know, I don't I don't ask for more than my clients, you know, credit card transaction. Look, if if you give me your sixty five bucks You'll get everything that I know and have worked on for the last year. You know, if I had to build this brand new from scratch for you know for a another uh, client, I mean, no. <laughs> you know? um, so again, the the weird stuff that's going on inside inside WordPress is that they've they've created this concept of copy left. It's never been tested in court. I wouldn't recommend that you guys test in court, but I think as you know, participants in the WordPress space, whether or not you're building, oh, and the other weird thing is that if you ever ship code to your client, odds are that that actually, by WordPress's standards, inherits the GPL. You can't copyright your code, you can't uh, patent your code. If you ship a customized solution to your client, your client can then, regardless of whatever it says on any piece of paper, contractually, if it goes through the magic cake feeding, <laughs> in theory, it inherits the GPL and therefore is free to distribute to my side. My understanding is if you're distributing it, it, it would take the GPL. If you're giving it to a, a, a client that's custom code that does not follow their GPL restrictions. No, that's true if you give it to your client, but once it's, once your client receives it, they can do whatever you want with it. So if you're taking some sort of secret sauce from your cabinet, Handing it to your client. Well, that's like any of them. Yeah, really has no but again, but, but you have no way of actually licensing to your end client. I, I wouldn't be able to. A library that says I can give them a copy of Microsoft. But they've got a CD burner. That's a wrap. I mean, that's that has nothing to do with the GPL. 
No, no, no. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say like, you know, oh yeah, you can't, you know, give them a copy of Word. What I'm saying is that for, for instance, most development studios, you know, you'll start working on your own set of, of code libraries. You'll have your own sort of tricks, secret solutions, stuff that that you take pride in ownership and that you've developed. Maybe it's even a set of plugins that you install on all client sites, you know, and say, okay, well this is I'm giving this to you because this is our shortcut to solve nine of the problems that I know you'll have. Um, the trick is, is that as soon as your client receives that code, you can't codify in a contract that they can't distribute. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, but again, not well, always tested it. You did yeah. Say that. What's that? <laughs> no, Susan Collins that. But uh, <laughs> but no. Uh, again, these are all things that if you extrapolate the worst case scenario of what might happen. If you're building code, if you're creating libraries, if you put it into the WordPress, I mean, if you put it up on the repo, it is absolutely GPL. You, if you put it on the repository, you're saying, I agree to the GPL, I abide by this, that's what it is. Um, I, my real hope is to sort of you know, help, I think we need to figure this out as a community. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, yeah. Oh, sorry. Sure. So, I mean, these things, because one can't exist without the other, it's a very symbiotic relationship, right? I mean, you, so in the in sense, it's not like you can't even use the, the App Store you mentioned before as the reference to the App Store, because <clears throat> that App Store, that could actually exist on its own. It doesn't need Apple to have, yes. Yeah, and, and Google is the perfect example. And, and the, the <clears throat> In terms of how the, the licensing is set up, um, and, and this is really prevalent in anything that you'll hear from the WordPress Foundation guys, the core guys, or, or the, uh, you know, the folks that are on but the argument is that once you create something in GPL, you can't change it without the consent of everybody who's contributed to it. So WordPress is and will always forever be GPL v2. They just cannot gather, I mean, literally they need every single person who's ever written a single line of code to approve a license change. That's what's written into the GPL. I mean, no. Doesn't it say V2 or later? What's that? I'm pretty sure it's phrase V2 or later. So they could, it would just make a lot of people angry. What's that? You're right. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's uh, written uh, V2 or later. So it wouldn't not, need to be. No, it's not. With my the patch, I try to commit to 3.4. Uh, GPL v3 code? No, no, what I mean is the code that is in there right now is, as far as I as far as I remember, underneath GPL v2 or later. That's for plugins. Mm, yeah, no, it's, WordPress, it's WordPress, WordPress, no, maybe that they won't no, allow v3 be be because GPL then the other code would also need to be elevated. No, WordPress, <laughs> WordPress will always be GPL v2. It cannot change. Um, they've, they've stated that time and time again. The reason why they've stated, there's another player involved in all of this, you know, sort of licensing drama, and that's the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And the EFF is basically the lawyers who back all of the open source technology. And they're headquartered out of San Francisco, and they get really, really good lawyers to work on, you know, intellectual property law problems for open source. There's a lot of legitimate concerns, but um, so the EFF has asserted that you know once you establish code in GPL v2, it is perpetually in GPL v2. Um, can't check change. out license.txt under any of your WordPress domains. Okay. Oh. I, um, I thought I heard Matt say one time that even if you wanted to change the license, he couldn't because it was about v2. Oops. Yeah, and that's that's been everything that I've read and everything that I've that I've heard. License.txt. Yeah, it should be. I think it's hard to your WordPress install that would be a Or I don't know what anybody was talking about. <laughs> uh, if you use security, that file's not there. Oh, oh, oh that's all I'm saying. So I'm so the There's nothing insecure about not including a license. I'm using industry and 
you know, people who are stealing music, you know, Napster and all yeah. that. But one of the things that's changed is, and, and maybe Sarah or somebody else could correct me, but I think a lot of that's gone away because it's, it's so much easier to just, you know, click buy on Amazon or iTunes. Well, I mean, yeah, I actually, sorry to like cut in, but this is like the one thing I did say that I actually know something Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the, the reason that file sharing took off so much is that the music industry is trying to fight against what people wanted. You know, people, like, I want, you know, I'm drunk. I want to listen to the Misfits at 3 in the morning. I don't have any Misfits. I'm going to torrent it. Right. Um, but as soon as, you know, with, with iTunes and all these other things, it, it cut down on it a lot because then it's like, it's so much easier to do that than risk, you know, Destroying the computer and putting on the file that you don't, you know. Right, and, and so my point is, is, I mean, that's that's where you have companies like Studio Press and Bradley Ones who are successful in spite of having GPL licensed software, mm -hmm. because it, you know sure. it's easier for me to find it. I know where to go. I know that I can get support. I know that I can get updates. I think the in and and again, this is kind of personal opinion. I think where we're missing, we've got. Developer scale application products that you can buy, but they typically run 50 bucks an hour, 100 bucks an hour, 200 bucks. You know, I, I mean, the theme products and companies typically run, you know, 40 dollars for one theme, 150 dollars for, you know, 10 themes, 300 dollars for, you know, a developer account. Um, what I think we're missing is that gap between free and 50 bucks. And I think we're missing by by a wide margin, and that's why you know okay. the existing companies, Theme Forest being probably the most significant one, um, those guys take I think it's sixty percent of the cost goes to marketplace uh, up until you make a certain threshold of sales. Um, Thirty percent is pretty deep, but it's kind of reasonable. Um, but without clarification on the GPL. Nobody really wants to be in this business. Nobody really wants to know whether or not they can protect developers' resources for them, or if they're just sort of becoming a hub for you know, downloading once and then okay, well and then go over to you know product marketplace two, and then everybody gets to gets to download it for free. I think look, there's no question even through the Napster era that there was no ambiguity. People were seeing. It's just that as a collective, large group, we all sort of said, yeah, OK, but you know. And, and I mean, I remember being in college and, and high school during that time. People would make every justification for it. Well, I wasn't going to download the whole album. You know, or, oh, I'm going to go to their concert, so I'm just going to you know, download it, and then I'll buy the shirts. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I don't buy albums because albums suck, but I'll download it for free and listen to it. Yeah, I mean, People rationalize unethical or, or incorrect behavior all the time. And, and we as a society. He's up to you. He, he's up to you. He wasn't talking about you. <laughs> hey, Dave. What about, what about encoding your code? <laughs> okay, well, wait, 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 wait. How about this? Okay, well, give me a second. Listen, man. Eh? Okay, what about. Give me a minute. Now, what about not encoding your code? Give me a second. What about not encoding your code, but just like changing all the va all the variable names and everything to just like gibberish? Yeah, obfuscating. Yeah, obfuscation is what works now. I mean, that's and the only I'll, thing you can I'll, do. I'll be honest. There's a copy of Dasher that has a lot more code comments than the one that shows. Hmm. That's a really crappy solution to a problem because it's really crappy code. But you know, there's a version that we ship to clients that says virtually nothing. You know, it just works. I guess it just works, but and it just hopefully, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you could like, I guess you could like base 64 the whole thing, and then uh, security yeah, would just does There's a membership <laughs> plugin that does that. I can't remember the name of yeah, it. Yeah, and, and there are other kinds of the problem with like base 64 um, is those are also pretty typically the the source of most injection attacks. So, you know, it's almost like we're we're now colluding with pirates to you know, <laughs> and Dre. Um, you know, it's it's a yes, there are ways to encrypt code, there is ways to, you know, obfuscate 
all sorts of variables to just base 64 the whole thing. When you base 64 something, the processor has to decrypt absolutely every single character of your code before it can then process your code. I mean, you're talking about probably yeah, tenfold process increase to go through. Okay, now I'm going to read what I just what I'm supposed to read, and then I'll read it. So right. again, I mean, those are all. The, those are all the half-baked solutions. But what, I guess what I'm asking is, like, what what are you expecting? Like, well, as you as a developer, what are you expecting to to have happen that would that would be good for you, but also be good for the community and also be good for as, for as, as a developer, I really think that if WordPress supported and endorsed a marketplace. So you're asking like a DRM solution with a key and and that sort of thing. I'm not. I will probably be the first to admit that I'm no way, shape, or form qualified to know what the technical implementation would be. You know, Dre would probably be a lot better on you know how to how to make a solution that might actually hold water. Um, but again, I don't think that our problem is the ethical problem of piracy. I, you know, pirates are going to pirate software. You, we right. can't really fight it. Absolutely. But. I think if we've got a legal protection in place to, you know, find the people who are really taking dollars out of our pockets, you know, I mean, the one off, the two off, you can't fight it. You, you're not going to send subpoenas and C and D orders to grandma's house. Mm -hmm. But you know, the, the really large scale, <laughs> um, you know, the, the really large scale. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to send uh, pirate and have to you know, but I, I think the really large scale problem is that I can't even necessarily assert that I own the software that we ship. I believe we do under split GPL, but again, that's you know it's a tricky argument to make. One of the only ways that I can actually hold our split GPL up and say, look, I have no choice, is because some of the files that we put inside Dasher. We've actually bought the uh, enterprise license of some of the graphics files. So I literally can't, I don't have the right to freely distribute some of the icons that we've bought and put into our piece of software. Mm -hmm. So now I've got our license rights for an image file that's copywritten and you know the, that person expects to get paid and, and have us honor their license and now you know, the WordPress solution, and I would bet that there's probably lots and lots of plugins that are violating, you know, some sort of copyright by taking either a piece of code that isn't open source or a, or a you know, graphics file that isn't owned in a, in a heavily used case. Um, the other way that things, that we can get around this is if there's things like design patents or um, functional patents that could protect some of these products uh, from an intellectual standpoint. Again, I don't know what all the legal options are. I think if if WordPress and Automatic took the lead and provided a pathway, right, you know, to say yes, you can freely distribute in the codex, or here's a pathway to commercialization. Um, I think it's kind of silly that we're eight years into this. We have a booming theme market. We have a booming plugin market. And we're all sort of out fending for ourselves. And the company that's really, you know, in charge of telling us what we can and can't do, to the point that we can't even sponsor their conferences, is not giving us a pathway to allow us to monetize this platform in a really responsible way. And I think it would benefit the consumers. I think it would benefit all of us as developers. I think it would, it would benefit the entire ecosystem. And you know, I think the only stranglehold from this happening right now is just that n there's not enough knowledge about what's wrong with the GPL to sort of encourage and promote you know the development community from asking for better solutions. Tabby. Yes, uh, Magento. This reminds me. Magento in November released a new thing called Fabric. Has anyone heard of that? A new what? You don't know which I noticed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so Magento released the fabric, which is um, what you're talking about, essentially, which is where you know, commercial licenses and, and you know, community licenses and things like that are distributed. Now, that's, that's uh, supported under Magento and eBay and also a whole 
Protection on that software you just dumped in a well, million dollars. And I'll, and I'll tell you, and I, and I brought it up briefly, but it's a huge, huge deal is that without legal protection, venture capital will not touch exactly. it. Exactly. Well, so, so, to bring this full circle, because we literally could go on this all night long. Oh, yeah. So, you, you well, that's why the thesis is on that. So, for all of you developers in the room, I'm going to segue to the closing discussion <laughs> through this, okay? So, we don't end up here all night long. You come to a point where you say, all right, we either have something or we don't. If we have something, we believe we can sell it, but what we need is to reach a larger market. And because of how very specific <coughs> Dash or it could be anything, because of how specific the behavioral change is, we're asking someone to make, to buy into the philosophies and principles that are sort of baked into Dash or listening principles, uh, content curation principles, um, distribution principles, uh, a listening strategy. These are things that aren't intuitive to every single blogger. Could they be beneficial? Sure, if you have enough time to train. But at $65 for a single sale, you're never going to make another penny on ever in life that product. You have to find a different way to market that product. And you've got to be able to monetize it in some way. So when you sit down and begin analyzing, where do we go to find the right capital to do that? Where can you go to get it? And you cannot ensure that you even own the intellectual property for it. You're left with apps. You, you can't. You're left with nothing. So your, you, your, your number of opportunities to make good, solid business decisions are whittled down to almost nothing. And, and I mean, I think. You know, look, Instagram for a billion bucks. Uh, Zynga was, oh my God, popped for like $150 million after six weeks. I mean, yeah, there's no doubt that there's, there's a ton of capital flowing through markets where somebody can say, you know, I own this, I made this. But not for a piece of software where you cannot ensure the IP. No one is going to do that. Nobody in their right mind is going to do that. Um, you were saying that automatic is funded, though? How, how did they get around? They, they, run, they run, run WordPress.com. Uh, they don't run WordPress.com. Right. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it runs the service. Is but yeah. you, you, no, you, you, you know, well, what? You you know, know, you know, know, their software is not cheap. You can put a lot of different stuff around process and that's and, 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 and that's exactly what they've done. They branch off the different services that those processes are completely independent from that platform. So we'll bring it full scope, which is why 
if we were to do it again, there would be a dashboard plugin that would be absolutely free that anyone could download. You could download it, you do it, and all you would do is access a third party service that would provide every single action that was taking place. And so we need to it. it. Yep. We've done the same exact thing. That's where we're going on the service. And that's where the current processes are completely independent of what our actual application is. That's exactly what we And that, and we give away our free plugin. We have a premium plugin. And we give away free clients. As a result, you have a piece of intellectual property that you absolutely own. They can't touch it. Right? They can't touch our ID. Well, we're platform independent, so there's, there's, you know, it's pretty hard. Yeah, it's a combination of, it's a combination of IP in terms of how we identify and we, and we recognize our signatures and remediate that. But then there's the process of remediation itself that's unique. So, and then there's the plugin aspect of it. Well, we've integrated components like a WAF and whatnot that would actively protect against brute force. That's all in the plugin. That's fine. It's no problem. But they can't even touch, get to touch our identification process or our remediation process. That's it. Which is completely independent of the plugin. Nothing in the plugin ties us to that. Yeah, one of the, another good example is the Discuss plugin. Sure. Is an iframe. I welcome it. And you're right on the side. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Hey! Yeah, it is a good discussion. So, as a result of all of the time we spent talking about business stuff, and a lot of you know, the only reason we moved into this building, the reason we chose this building, was to host WordPress meetups. Crazy decision to make as a business, but that's why we moved in here. So, we obviously have a vested interest in making certain that the WordPress community is supported, and we support it with our pocketbook. Right? Happy to do it. Love to do it. Wouldn't change this decision for the world. One of the best decisions we've ever made. So, really, really happy. And we've always had this extra space up there. We've done nothing with except house Steve's poker tables and host late night cigar smoking poker drinking parties that I don't even want to know what goes on. Come in. Come in. A couple weeks ago, before we headed off, Dave and Steve and I sat down and we said, are we ever going to do anything with that space up there? And we decided to move forward with some concepts. We're not 100% certain where it's going to go yet. But what we did know was that no matter what we decided to do, whether we decided to go with just a straight, flat out co-working space, whether we decided we'd take it one step further and create a sort of a form of incubator, because we've built a lot of products, we've sold a lot of products here over the course of our being in business since 1995. We know a lot of stuff. Um, we can help developers you know, launch things if we need to and potentially go out and find capital if we need to do that too, under the right circumstances. We decided we'd go ahead and begin building out that space upstairs into uh, a usable co-working space. So I invite you all to go and take a look at what Dave did last week while we were in Atlanta in painting and uh, putting together a whole bunch of IKEA desks. And if you've never uh, been in the process of putting together one of those desks, you know that that is an act. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also Jen here and, and, Jen well. and Kelly Houser. Okay, so Kelly Kohler did as well. Um, the electrical stuff is not run through there yet, so that we've got power to all the different tables, and we're not certain how we're going to make certain that you know it gets used properly. We don't know what the model is yet. You'll hear about it as we develop it. We'll be as open with it as possible and let you know how it's going to work and how it's going to happen. But if you'd like to see where it's at, it's upstairs, and you can take a look around and say, See where they're going. Yes, you need more work, but <laughs> I see where you're going. All right. I think it works the way it was now. I was on the couch this afternoon. So um, thanks everyone for coming. And if you don't mind, if you're sitting in a chair, just plop it over against this wall.